Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. It's very common for patients to have some gastrointestinal upset with ibrutinib. And this most commonly is going to be a very mild, semi-soft to watery stool a couple of times a day once they initiate the ibrutinib. I actually believe that this diarrhea is a result of EGFR inhibition and is similar to the diarrhea that we see with other EGFR inhibitors. One of the things that I found to be helpful in avoiding the diarrhea in patients taking ibrutinib is for them to take the pills at night at bedtime when there's no food in their GI tract afterwards. And in essence, they find out they wake up in the morning having maybe one loose stool. Most actually do quite well. So in the early studies, we were seeing diarrheal rates of approximately 50%, almost all of it grade one and two. But in my patient population, with the maneuver of taking it at bedtime, the rate's probably much less in the range of maybe about three to five percent with the grade one at worst. So I think that's a very important way to help make ibrutinib better tolerated. Regarding the bruising, the bruising is primarily cosmetic, which is very fortunate. We have some data suggesting that ibrutinib inhibits TEC kinase and BTK in the platelets, sort of interfering with the ability of platelets to respond to collagen-induced platelet activation. We do find that the platelet counts in CLL patients seem to plateau and never fully recover in about the 100 to 120,000 range. What we see in these patients who have been on ibrutinib for long periods of time, in the order of one to three years, is that their bone marrows will actually empty out of the CLL, and there'll be an increase in megakaryocytes, and we'll find giant platelets present in the peripheral blood. In essence, looking a little bit like there's a lot of uh, increased platelet destruction. And it really is probably an impact of the ibrutinib on platelet longevity. So you end up with giant platelets, which probably are hyperfunctional, and we certainly see patients have no significant bleeding. So when you look at the Resonate trial, comparing and as well as the Helios trial, looking at the risk of grade one and two bleeding between the ibrutinib and the placebo arms, or the ibrutinib and the ofatumab arms, we certainly see a marked increase in the number of grade one and two bleeding. But that bleeding includes bruising, contusion, petechiae, a lot of different entities. And what's important to remember is that the risk of grade three and four bleeding, or hemorrhage, is really equivalent in both arms. So I think that the, it's safe to say that the bleeding we see with ibrutinib is more cosmetic than anything else. With that being said, I do have my patients hold the ibrutinib for seven days before and after any major procedure. This really just is to play it safe and to guarantee that there's not going to be any excess bleeding or impaired wound healing during the procedure. And if a patient's been on ibrutinib sufficiently long that their CLL is well controlled, there really is no risk in terms of the disease flaring back or in the patient's experience any symptoms from holding the ibrutinib. The final toxicity worth mentioning with ibrutinib is the atrial fibrillation. The atrial fibrillation was first noticed in the Resonate study, where there was a rate of about 5 to 7 percent in the patients who received ibrutinib compared to a rate of only 1% in the patients who received ofatumumab. This comparison was a little bit problematic because the patients had been on ibrutinib for far longer than the patients on ofatumumab, just given the better outcomes in the patients on ibrutinib. Additionally, 1% risk of atrial fibrillation does sound a little bit low for a population of patients who are as sick as the patients were in that study. So the Helio study, when it came out, actually confirmed that there was an increased risk of atrial fibrillation with ibrutinib compared to patients who had received placebo. It's not completely clear what the etiology or what's the mechanism of that atrial fibrillation, but it is something to keep in mind. The important question about the atrial fibrillation still remains if there are risk factors that we can identify that would predict who are those patients we need to be extra cautious about? 
Two, whether or not we need to actually stop the ibrutinib should the atrial fibrillation start. And three, whether or not the atrial fibrillation is any more difficult to control. So when I do have a patient who is on ibrutinib and develops atrial fibrillation, I do stop the medication, but more from an issue of questions surrounding the need for anticoagulation and the patient undergoing procedures. If I have patients who are able to go convert back into normal sinus, I will put them back on ibrutinib. If I have patients who remain in atrial fibrillation, even off the ibrutinib, I will often, if their CLL requires therapy, just put them back on ibrutinib as well, with the idea being that it doesn't appear that the ibrutinib, in a patient already with atrial fibrillation, that the ibrutinib makes it any more problematic. Ibrutinib is generally a well-tolerated oral therapy. Some of the symptomatic toxicities that patients experience include diarrhea, which tends to be limited and early. In many cases, it resolves on its own within the first month or two. So this is not a major reason why patients discontinue drug, but it does happen occasionally. Another symptomatic toxicity that's turned out to be somewhat significant is arthralgias. And in my experience, patients do discontinue ibrutinib fairly often for the arthralgias. Sometimes a short course of corticosteroids can help with arthralgia, but there are occasional patients who find it not tolerable. Most patients also experience easy bruisability and delayed wound healing, which is in fact likely an on-target tar effect of inhibition of BTK. BTK is present in platelets and required for aggregation of platelets induced by collagen or shear stress. And there is a bleeding diathesis that's seen in abrutinib-treated patients. Most of the bleeding is low grade, but there have been intracranial hemorrhages, including spontaneous intracranial hemorrhages, and GI bleeds are reasonably common. Furthermore, some of the early such bleeds occurred in patients concurrently treated with warfarin, which led initially to the recommendation against any warfarin use. Personally, I have tended to avoid using any anticoagulation in common with abrutinib because we don't fully understand the bleeding diathesis and some patients are subject to it significantly even without anticoagulation. There's very limited data on combining any anticoagulant with abrutinib right now. The most data are with low molecular weight heparin, but this is still limited to approximately 40 to 50 patients, and that includes patients receiving both prophylactic as well as therapeutic dosing. Aspirin is generally safe, it appears, based on a couple hundred patients, but some patients do experience exacerbation of the easy bruising in combination with aspirin. So many times I will end up stopping aspirin too for those patients who can tolerate that. There's very little combination data with clopidogrel at all. The other primary important medical side effect of abrutinib is an incidence of atrial fibrillation, which emerged really from the randomized trial Resonate, in which 10 patients treated with abrutinib developed atrial fibrillation in contrast to only one on the ofatumumab arm. This has generally been medically managed and not a major problem in terms of restarting the abrutinib, except for the potential conflict with the need for anticoagulation. There are several toxicities associated with idelisib that are important to take note of. The first that we see in treatment is a transaminitis. What's interesting is this transaminitis begins between weeks 4 and 12 and is always asymptomatic. It's just in transaminitis and it's not associated with a hyperbilirubinemia. The transaminitis resolves with holding the idelisib and in many cases I've been able to reintroduce the idelisib a second time at the same dose without a recurrence of the transaminitis. Now in some patients who do have a recurrence of the transaminitis, what I've done is actually reduced the dose to 100 milligrams twice a day. And those patients often have been able to tolerate the reintroduction of the idelisib without the transaminitis. And after 12 weeks on therapy, I've just re-escalated their dose to 150 milligrams twice daily. I do believe it's important to re-escalate the dose once a patient gets through that 12-week period because we really don't have data that we're not 
sacrificing something by dropping our dose from 150 to 100 milligrams twice daily. The second toxicity that we worry about with idelisib is diarrhea. The diarrhea associated with idelisib can re it comes in two different types. The first one is a very mild early diarrhea, which is one that's probably grade one at worst when it does occur, and is something that is easily controlled with antidiarrheal agents. The second diarrhea, which is a late diarrhea, tends to be very fulminant and very severe, classically grade three or four, and very watery, and associated with really a colitis. So patients on biopsy will have a lymphocytic colitis that really looks like inflammatory bowel disease. These patients, when they get diarrhea, need to be very quickly treated with intravenous fluids to maintain their hydration status, and corticosteroids. And it can either be systemic corticosteroids, either oral or intravenous, depending upon the severity, or even budesonide as an orally non-bioavailable steroid that will just treat the GI tract. In some patients who have had a relatively mild late diarrhea, it is possible to actually continue or resume the idelisib with the budesonide, in concomitant budesonide, in order to help control the recurrence of the diarrhea.